Aha, uh -huh. are we ready to rock and roll? Yeah? Okay. First, first I'd like to thank very much uh, some of these very special folks over here. It was the family of strength, um, Bert Soren. I, I met him at SHOT Show, and then we did a tactical course together, and it was shoot, move, communicate. It was fitness, and uh, being such a high-level athlete, uh, you know, national-level uh, world uh, competitor, businessman, father, um, a leader to me, uh, he came out to this new world of, of down-and-dirty warrior fitness, which had to do with combat casualty carries, uh, uh, reading terrain, having stresses of people trying to kill you as well, and then having to perform. He got such a respect from my background, and I'm not even the best of us. I'm not the best of my background. Uh, I did very well to bring my team home alive out of Fallujah and Ramadi, and I've been to three wars as a recon marine, and then two more as a contractor in Africa, did good enough to bring my men home in the most arduous conditions since Hue City. I did something, but there are men better than me. And what I like to say is, uh, jack of all trades were masters of none. I can name 10 pe people better than me at everything I do. And I illustrate, I, I work out, I do martial arts, I, I, um, I like to shoot, and um, I like to play with kids and, and teach, but there's somebody out there. And when, many of you are those people better than me. This master of, uh, of life found value in me, brought me into this world, and I'd been struggling really bad since I got out of the fighting forces. Um, I know now what I need, and what I need for my personal uh, spaceship and you know, my emotional cosmonaut that I create to be successful and to journey is I need family, community, I need mission, something to be proud of, something that's, uh, uh, that's esoteric but steeped in altruism and virtue. And I need nature. I need Mother Nature. And so it was rad that we got to train outside today, too. So killer. So that's, uh, that's just a little bit about me. I met John Wellborn and the team at Power Athlete through Bert, and it was match made in heaven. And we've got sniper brothers here. We've got, we've got soldiers. We've got some SEAL brothers. We've got... Coaches, athletes, world champions, uh, record holders. I mean, dang, uh, that's a pretty legit resume for, for a little freaking house party, I'd say. So um, without further ado, just thank you again so much, John Wellborn. Uh, Bert uh, has been my father of this new family. Uh, and my brother right over here, Derek Woodski. Uh, my sniper brother over here. Um, my legendary freaking Brady Tatanka that knows how to elk hunt like nobody's business. Um, and can kill terrorists, too. Uh, thank you guys so much. So a round of applause. All right. Uh, we'll just start with a little bit about me, and then that way we can get into the galaxy of body. And it's interesting. I created this galaxy of body just a few weeks ago. I'm like, what the hell can I talk about in an environment like this with so many prestigious uh, teachers, athletes, coaches, coaches? Um, what do I have to offer, really? I'm not, uh, I, I call myself the barbell ballerina because compared to all y'all, I'm kind of a slim guy. Uh, so uh, I'm excited what you all think about the galaxy of body after we're done with this talk. So if we could turn the lights down and um, uh, here we are. Cosmic forces in life and death struggle. Um, this is not a concept, this is the truth. There's not too many truths as human beings that we can observe and uh, coalesce on, but this is the base one. And the whole ethos from athlete comes from the cosmic forces in life and death struggle, all right? Athlete is a flavor of war. War is the essence of cosmos. War does not have to be negative. War just is. Oftentimes, it's filled with suffering and destruction, but from that we glean what is very best in human character. Uh, how do we get to the videos, brother? Oh, uh, it must be. Okay, and if we don't get the video, it's pretty rad vi video. Um, 
Yeah. Um, oh, man. Well, I, I, if we don't get the video. We're going to work on it. Okay, no problem. You work on that dang video. So I'm going to go ahead and move on into the Big Bang Theory. So as I was speaking earlier about the galaxy of body, I call it the galaxy of body. Um, I loosely based the concept from uh, Mishima, a uh, Japanese artist, painter, and filmmaker, philosopher, and early bodybuilder in Japan. Um, there was a, a, a fall down of pride in Japan after the, uh, the end of World War II. They were defeated. Uh, they came from a very honorable culture, a shame-based culture, but an honorable culture from the samurai times, feudal Japan. Mishima, Yukio Mishima, uh, had lost his faith in his country and lost his faith and direction uh, as a so-called professional or, or some kind of man or human. So what did he do? He went back to the samurai ethos and got heavy into disciplining his body, bodybuilding, and he called his art project of suicide by bodybuilding the river of body. So the river of body is where I thought, well, it's not just a river for us, because a river we can get in and out, and we can dry off. But uh, the galaxy is continually swirling around us, and we're swirling in it too. So that's the Big Bang Theory, is when all the ingredients inside of each and every one of you, everything uh, in our immediate vicinity and everything in the outer reaches of the universe were these ingredients that when they slowed down and got cold, they got so cold and so, so, so dark that they crushed into each other. And the next thing was a huge explosion. Ah, ah. That's the Big Bang Theory in a nutshell. I recommend you read some Bill Bryson. He's a little bit more eloquent scientifically about the whole dang thing. But um, the uh, life and death struggle, cosmic, things that come together, explode and rip apart, this is the Big Bang Theory. Oh, do you think we got it, brother? Oh, oh you guys will like this one even more then. Watch this. Survival is combat proven and often in one lifetime we will have a few different theaters in which we fight. The reason I first started training martial arts was to protect my little brothers and to protect myself from the gangs, the bullies, and from poverty. That's what made me a fighter. I don't like fighting. I love it because it's honest, because it causes me to choose fear or bravery, and I choose bravery. Martial arts, and specifically Chinese Kung Fu, is a relationship and connection between nature's truth and combat-proven method, and keeping a mind and body open as a vessel, as an athlete, a state of readiness that's supported by creation. Stillness is a state of grace in which any action can come out of. And it's the same in a coiled snake while its prey crosses its path. Stillness is the ultimate precept for explosive action. through these limits, which are mostly emotional. Without that battle being won, all other battles in your life are going nowhere. Ethical, moral, spiritual purity in a universe that conspires to be chaotic is the ultimate war. Beauty is my ultimate message. I'm looking to define beauty through the acceptance of this little carbon life form. The cost of extremity, the cost of glory, I pay for it every day. I pay for it with the scars on my body. I pay for it with the disillusionment 
in my soul. I carry a nihilism that I never did before. But is there any other way for a warrior but to go into the fray to be baptized by fire? There, there is no other way that I know. So I will continue to go into the fire. I will, with pure loving rage, accept the fray as my existence, if it's honest. When it, uh, the fray, the fight, the battlefield, the gridiron, f the football field, um, the training pitch, uh, Kandahar, it's uh, all the battlefield. Um, and the fray uh, is that crazy chaos, but the beauty in it too. So when we watch this little video with little men, was it, was it, um, um, who, who was it, brother? Which, which of your little beautiful kids says, I'm, Ezra says, uh, he was about three at the time, four at the time? Little Ezra, Bert's uh, mammoth of a child, um, <laughs> does an incredible T-Rex um, impersonation. He says, Daddy, can I go into the fray? I want to go into the fray, Daddy. Like, keep that attitude. So that's a little bit about where I come from. I'm sure you've seen parallels and felt parallels in that uh, beautiful video in Iceland in your own lives. So um, let us move on. Now the myths. I am able to gain great, great power from myth. And we talk about in, in sports all the time, our favorite champions uh, in bodybuilding, Frank Zane or, or, the, um, or Bill Pearl. Um, and in the military, uh, we have our General Mattis, which, by the way, I fought for him. Man, am I the most lucky man in the world. And it seems that there's always grace and luck that comes my way somehow. My first mission in Afghanistan in 01, we had, uh, when the towers fell, I was on a ship. So I went in uh, with my platoon, and I was a very junior man. And I was already schooled out. Uh, I was a recon marine, a scout sniper, a seer, a paratrooper, combat dive, mountain warfare, all this. And still I was green. Four years of this arduous selection process and schooling, and still I was very uh, junior. I was the point man of my five-man team. Uh, foreboding and uh, an immediacy that if I did not have it checked could turn into fear. So that's what I was dealing with, right? We move into an opium factory. The cats from SWAR and Recon and Rangers, we shot the hell out of everything and everyone in there. After we got all the bodies moved out to this latrine and burn pit, I mean, man, this is expeditionary warfare. Uh, we immediately go into mission planning and we get our op order and we're in a mission planning and four hours from now, I've got to insert. I'm the junior man, scout snipers. Well, three of us are scout, three of the five of us are scout snipers, but I'm in charge of camouflage and the route. No one knew that we were going to be fighting in, in uh, high altitude desert, so we had mostly jungle gear. Jungle colored rucks, OD uh, colored deuce gear. Back then, uh, because we were cool guys, we were recon marines, we didn't even have helmets. We called them domes of obedience. We never even had helmets. Uh, yeah, right? Uh, we just had bigger rucks. And I'll get into that later, too, about um, pushing the broom and caring more and how that is an excellent example of leadership. So here I, I'm looking for something that I can camouflage our rucks, our big green uh, olive drab uh, packs and our deuce gear with. And I'm Mexican-American, so I learned how to... Uh, to make tortillas. So I know how to, I know that there's these pita bread people that eat a bunch of pita bread. There's got to be some flour around here. So I find some flour, I make a paste, and, and I'm pasting and then, and then uh, dusting sand and dust uh, on top of the paste. So I'm camouflaging our kit, and it's incredibly stressful, everything going on. You can imagine it's us, it's the SEALs, and then uh, DevGru comes in too, SAS, Brit, uh, Aussie SAS as well, Germans, and then a bunch of dudes. Uh, that I thought were the coolest looking sunglass dudes I'd ever see in my life with beards kind of like this and nice clothes and really shit hot weapons. I guess they're called contractors. I didn't know about any of that stuff back then, right? <laughs> Little dude, uh, did I know I'd be one of those guys one day. So um, uh, 
as I'm on my knees, and I'm, I'm, I'm camouflaging our kit, and I'm taking it very seriously, and I'm in charge of the route, too. So back then, we didn't even have the, um, what we take for granted in the iPhone with the GPS and, and how to uh, upload and link everybody up on satcoms at the same time. So I had to draw our overlays or draw our routes on acetate. And I had to do a triple acetate, one for my arrow, one for my commander, and one for the, for the Mew commander, who was Colonel Mattis at the time. He hadn't pinned on general until it, after we came back from Afghanistan. Well, these, there's bad guys out there, you all. All right? Um, my target was the, uh, uh, you youngsters may not remember this, but do you remember the monkey bars and, and the uh, Al-Qaeda training compound or the, or the you know, the, these guys and the, these guys? You remember that little video? That was my target, right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that wild? Uh, and by the way, I never saw that video. You guys saw the video. I didn't see that video. It was a freaking, that was my target. Um, and some birds came in, uh, 46, uh, a dual prop bird, and then some gunships, uh, Cobras. And they were, uh, they were an escort. And it was very hot out there because they still had lots of Stinger missiles that we had facilitated to the Taliban when, we were, when they were fighting. And we were fighting by proxy the Soviet Union. So I was like, man, whoever's flying in those things is crazy. Because when I flew in, we were shooting and bombing the fuck out of everything because of the threat. So they came in with just two escorts and this 46 dual prop guy. Well, everything's happening really fast. My assistant team leader is like kind of chewing. Or I guess everybody's chewing everybody's asses because we got to get shit done fast. And I saw my assistant team leader, Castillo, kind of like straighten up. And then he put himself at parade rest. And, you know, we're around some pretty bad pipe hitters and shit like that out there. But uh, none of us go to parade rest for anybody out there because we're all war fighters. We all think that we're the best. And so when I saw him stepping up, I look. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? And then I see this glint of some brass you know, on a collar. And we're all sterilized. So, I, so it's like... The hell? Sure enough, General Mattis, Colonel Mattis at the time. And I get up, of course, parade rest. And he's so proud. He's like, because he's got a little bit of a lisp, you know. Like, devil dog, it's all right. But just remember, you shoot every one of those motherfuckers in the face, because if they have a chance, they'll do the same to you. Well, nice little segue, but. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, that, you know, that, and now, General Mattis, Secretary of Defense, Mattis, he's a myth. He's. He's, uh, um, he was a platoon commander in Vietnam. Uh, I, I later fought for him in the invasion of Iraq in 03. Um, so myths. Uh, Superman. Um, Cal L flying from the, uh, you, you know, outside of the universe and crashing, crash landing into uh, Earth and gaining his powers by being that alien but keeping the altruism. Um, Leonidas. Uh, when we watch 300 or, get, or read Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield, another Marine Corps officer from Vietnam, uh, these are the myths. And why do they sustain? Because it's, again, a cosmic battle of life and death. And through that battle, we uh, aspire for greatness because it develops character. And it develops insight. And it develops a reverence. And it develops benevolence. Why we love children so much, I think, really... We know their innocence is going to be stripped. And we know they are going into the fray. Maybe not consciously we don't think that way. But the truth is, that is exactly what's going to happen. Nothing else but that can happen. So we treasure that innocence. and We protect it as much as we can. And then also as they start to mature, we impart knowledge, wisdom, skills, tactics, techniques to navigate through the war that they're going to be coming into, known as life. So myth, myth, 300, King Leonidas, 300 brothers, uh, him and 300 brothers uh, answered the call, and he was the king, leadership, he pushed the broom, he pushed the broom, he led his men, stacked bodies, like John Bass alone, stacked bodies, and when the freaking hordes, uh, the Persian invasion kept coming, officially I think they, I think it was like 100,000, but 
in the myth, it's like 300,000 against 300 hard chargers. And still, we sing about it, we talk about it, we make films about it. Frank Miller draws comics about it. Um, we all look at this Greek ideal as our model for a reason. Time eternal, combat proven, and through this process of loss, destruction, pain, misery, suffering, we find the best pieces of ourselves as well. All right? Now, biology. And this next slide is going to trip you out a little bit. It trips me out a little bit, too. Biology. Uh, when we think about evolution, and all of us athletes here, we're interested in this very much. How, uh, by show of hands, in our little workout today, how many people learned something new? <laughs> how many people discovered a nuance that was an evolution from their own framework that they thought was pretty dialed in? And these are no schlubs in this audience. So this is biology. We are designed to evolve. All right? OK, oh, you got me. OK. Now, this is my crazy uh, Siddhartha Indian evolution right here. I just want to throw it up to you, up there to you guys. I mean, this is Darwin up top. You guys got that one. But this is my Indian stuff, uh, steeped, in, <laughs> steeped in magic, steeped in cool freaking animal men, beings. Stuff that really freaking turns me on, you know? So again, evolution, and look now, and still look what our ideal is, um, even in, in, in imagery, art, song, it's beauty. And what's the beauty based on? The beauty is based on strength. So let us remember that. The beauty is based on strength. All right, next. Oh, okay, now this is a video, brother. Now watch this. This is one of my all-time favorite military films. There's only a few. Because I've got a little PTSD. I don't like hearing a bunch of gunfire and stuff like that, unless i got a gun with me. Uh, so we'll turn down the lights a little bit. <laughs> True story, for real. of the sirens, which is an example of all man's, in it, all man's frailty towards pastime entertainment. Uh, oh, it's all right. Pa it's all right. Um, anyway, I, I thought that that, that Botravai, which means good work, was an excellent example of the life and death struggle that exists in the cosmos and it, it exists in all of our uh, personal dramas, our competitions in sport, and then uh, the life and death that uh, is found on the battlefield, and then the after effects, because there's always winners and losers. Um, but damn, if uh, you, you get it correct, you can lose and never be a loser. All right? So next. All right, now we're going to get to the positive stuff. All right, this is Infinite Go, Heroes, Chun Man Sit, and Recon. Now, when I spoke on myth before, I was, uh, I was still staying pretty positive. Uh, I still think of the heroes, but it's almost always tragic. 
as we start to evolve, so our heroes don't have to be tragic now as we, as we evolve and as we mature. Um, so, uh, so there's starting to be a shift, and there's a shift like this in my life. Um, recon, and that was my, that was my samurai code. Um, back to the samurai. I'll pull up here in a moment when I show a picture of Wolverine. He's got a samurai sword. Um, when I mentioned to you about Yukio Mishima, this filmmaker, River of Body, he uh, created a coup to overthrow the Japanese government because, we became, because the Japanese government became the uh, lapdogs of the United States as we became mechanized and they made goods for us. He says, no, I, I will not go down that way, neither will my glorious country, neither will my glorious ethos. So uh, he staged a coup and he took on um, the army ultimately by himself in samurai armor was shot to death with his sword out. Ah, you must look into Yukio Mishima. You guys will be moved. River of body. All right, here we go. Who's this guy? Yeah! Crushed the four-minute mile. Defeated it. He saw the hordes of Persia and did his duty. And those hordes of Persia, in this case, was the damn clock. But it was just as deadly because it had knocked out every other man that tried, and woman that's tried to break this record until him. After he defeated that horde, that Persian horde, this is now the standard for excellence in this field. Right? So when we think about mythology and then moving into heroes, what he did is it, he took every bit of training and skill and mentorship from around him. He constantly was in a state of self-effacement because disillusionment with self precedes enlightenment. You'll hear me say that over and over again. I learned it from Roger Sparks. He was my mentor in recon, and now he is the highest decorated pararescueman of all time. And we need to find a way to get him here and we're at Summer Strong next year and the years ahead. The, one of the most profound men, also one of the most gentle men, but, uh, and also one of the most deadly. He taught me so much. He modeled so much for me. Um, these, these archetypes, um, they're accessible to all of us. And I bet if we just slow down enough and look around in our lives, we have them in our life already. All right? Heroes. Who's my man? Mother Frappin. Mother Frappin Wolverine. All right. Uh, since I was a little kid, I've been reading comic books. And I like to draw comic books. And what a great way, when you see little children imitating things that inspire them, um, support it with all you got. Support it. Because they are creating their own myths and creating their, old, their own pantheons of gods that support virtue, strength, things that we know um, ratify and support the best of human society. All right? And that's my man. And if you ever read the Frank Miller um, uh, story arc that he did in 1982, Wolverine, the freaking pit fighter, the X-Man, the rebel, the badass, he loved to drink beer and didn't give an F. He went to Japan, and no matter how badass he was, and, no, and he's got a healing factor, you can't kill him, he's a badass fighter, he's got freaking swords that stick out of his hands, he still got his ass kicked. He got his ass kicked by a man with a freaking wooden sword. Whooped his ass, whooped his ego, whooped his pride. But he didn't stay down. Instead, he used that as information, took nothing negative from it, and uh, he cultivated his skill, his um, character, and through that, reclaimed his honor. All right? Wolverine. Now, this is Chun Man Sit. This is my Chinese Kung Fu teacher. He's 65. Uh, he, I made him look... Uh, small, so he always called, I was his biggest fighter, so um, he, he always called me the big guy, me, and for Mexican-American, I was like, well, I'm a little tall, but, uh, you know, I'm not real big. Uh, he, uh, he was so revolutionary and influential in my, in my approach to sport, to training, most importantly, to training, and I don't mean techniques. 
I mean a framework in which mentally, emotionally, and physically I can get involved in process, not the product. And all you super strong dudes and women that are into the weightlifting, a little too crazy in my opinion, um, <laughs> be, be, because the number of reps and poundages be, become the dictating force of what you consider a success. And what happens? You know what happens. All of y'all are hurt. <laughs> Every dang one of you. And, and it's because we fall out of process and we get lured and enticed by the sirens of product. Is it the medal? Is it the championship? Is it the accolade? Is it the, is it the uh, band-aid of poor self-esteem? But you, all that stuff goes away. We truly become the Godhead when we stay in process. And that's what SIT taught me. And that's probably why I'm here to this day. There's a lot of great war fighters out there. There really is a lot of them, way better than me. But because of the background that Chun Man Sit taught me, I had an ability to, um, from the chrysalis and from the ashes, become a butterfly again after my wars were over and my youth was gone. Chun Man Sit. All right, now I've got another video. So I'm going to show, I'm gonna show you my little man, Chun Man Sit. And then I'm going to tell you some of the things he told me. And they're going to blow your mind. Check it out, Michael is a playboy gangster, way more anxious, ready to be placed in handcuffs and shipped out to Pelican Bay, he plays the role of an N.W.A., better than Dre, he'll catch a body by the end of the day, step up and spray, till your organs look like red peppers and steak, so your body look like a fucking hungry pig, and your face got beef with an ugly stick, oh, he's a killer boy, ain't nothing other boy, fuck a girl, he got ammo to fill the void, shotgun pumps, MAC-10s and Teflons, his cat spin shells fall, pounds See while you falling asleep now He'll creep through your streets Just leave you beat down And gasping for air and such Pay attention, peep who be wearing what oh, Fellas wear blue and walk around with a gag Crack baby, crack baby, baby, crack, crack Fellas wear red and walk around and bust shots Pop baby, pop baby, baby, pop, pop Players wear gators and they know where it's at Mac baby, Mac baby, baby, Mac, Mac Pop said do it, diggers, show them what they lack Rap baby, rap baby, baby Straight out of high school, nice dude But he's wicked as Ice Cube, nice dude But he do gang bang You beat your body with karate like the Wu-Tang Clan you Just whip out, let it clip out Blow a hip out, before he flip out Now, niggas been out They get they running man on, they get to step in Cause they know that boy, you'll get the weapon Make you lay down, careful what you say now Don't make homicide, find you in the playground Or in the back streets of who knows where Who knows why, who don't care He don't cry, but he got a tear tattoo Two right by his eye And a loaded 357 right by his side So if it's any beef, he's already prepared He got an M16 and machete to spare oh, Fellas wear blue and walk around with a gag Crack, baby, crack, baby, baby, crack, crack Fellas wear red and walk around and bust shots Pop, baby, pop, baby, baby, pop, pop Players wear gators and they know where it's at Mac, baby, Mac, baby, baby, Mac, Mac Pop said do it, niggas, show them what they lack Rap, baby, rap, baby, baby, rap, yeah. rap Now Ivan is a pimp, driving in a six Diamond in the back, diving in a bitch In and out of clubs, beefing with the dogs Pants made of silk, even with the rug Now a lay the gators on, thinking he's stupid And the little chicken heads in his looking be soup He's a player, like a mayor, pumping hay Pretty rad, huh? Pretty freaking rad. Um, he taught me so much. Uh, he did not coach me. He gave me assignments. It took me two years to be his indoor student. And I'd already been doing Shaolin Kung Fu and was a wrestler um, and a boxer um, since I was a little kid. I grew up in the Omaha home for boys, so I've been fighting since I was very small. Um, what did you say, brother, about c coaching? Or I think it was text. Coaching? Or coach, you can coach somebody, but what's best is when you lead them. And sometimes that means that you just take a few steps ahead or maybe uh, run a few clicks away and see how they look as they're approaching and following you. You can't rush it. So he rarely corrected me, I'd say, until two years into training. And mostly he had me do a lot of boring shit. 
right? And so we are doing it today, getting back to the basics, right? Opening hips, standing on one foot. Man, I'm telling you, that's the gold. Once I achieved a baseline of spatial awareness, physical awareness, vitality, so I was a vegetarian, I was a tall, long fighter at 155, so I fought at 155, I was long. Then the technique was layered upon. Then the higher level conceptual strategies were layered upon. Um, God, it's immense. He never said, and back to you, Tex, he never said, that's good. Actually, he told me, he told me behind my back after five years of, of, of training and like 20 gold medals, I, be, I became a, a world champion in San Shao, um, um, fencing, Shui Jiao wrestling. Um, and then, of course, because I wanted to be legit, I practiced sword and did all of the uh, empty handsets too. You know, I didn't want to be that one-trick pony. I heard behind my back, Ludi, Ludi's staff work, got jing, good. And I was like, wow. He would always say, ah, not too bad. He never said good. So pretty soon you stopped looking for any kind of compliment or any kind of correction because he, and then a trust happened too. Because if you were going the wrong way, he would guide you back. You had to trust the process. Process, process, process. And I know it's very Eastern in our world, right? Because we need immediate results in sport and in uh, um, war, immediate results. It was amazing. Uh, when I won the Jingwu um, competition, I guess that was 95. And I had already been knocked unconscious in the early morning as the demonstrator, because I was the demonstrator. I wanted to learn so much. I practiced with everybody I could. And there was a Shaolin monk there known as the Iron Leg of China. Uh, yeah, I, I shit you not. And they bring out the big guy for him to show his freaking, um, his San Shao and his Shui Jiao. And a uh, small man, maybe about 110 pounds. Um, bones and skin and muscle made of living steel. Well, we were on a, a, a floor like this, and he had me punch at him, or shoot on him, or punch at him, and he dropped levels, and he reached so deep behind my legs, and he snapped them in, and the back of my head hit the deck. Boom, I bounced up. I was unconscious. I started, like, kind of get, giggling, going, ha, ha, and then I had to compete in my first event, like, I don't know, 20 minutes later. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you guys have had similar situations. Uh, right? Uh, so after I win this comp competition, and by the way, I'm a white guy, or Latin, Latin American, Latin, you know, United States. I was, I was mostly competing against Chinese and Japanese and some Thais and some Europeans, people in a lot of ways that were much more professionally adept. My Kung Fu teacher, until we started winning together, was a short order cook at a grocery store in Lee Summit, Kansas, all right? So after, and then I had to spar and fight as the last thing because that's what draws everybody out. They don't show the fighting early in the competition because everybody will leave after the fights. So the fights are at the very end. I've competed all freaking day, concussed too. Gold medal, gold medal, gold medal. I mean, it was just raining on me, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? Uh, there's no middleweight, so I have to fight the heavyweights. And they're big, man. And size and, uh, size and weight matters, as you strength athletes, explosive athletes, football athletes know. Uh, I won. I, I, like, I fought three times. And I was very tired on my last fight. My little brother Michael was helping in my corner. I'm like, oh, I'm like doggy, doggy, I'm so tired. Dog. What should I do? Just kick his fucking ass. That's what he said. <laughs> So I win, they bring out a trophy, I got a medal. I can't believe this freaking glory. And uh, some people are picking me up, some Chinese people are mad at me. Um, <laughs> and so I, go, <laughs> so I go over there and I said, this is it, Sifu, Sifu, I won, I'm the best Sifu. And he goes, Ludi, you won, yes, but Ludi, uh, you, 
You won because the best guy didn't show up. Damn. <laughs> right? The best guy didn't show up. There's always the best guy out there. Right? How, I mean, you, some of you all have been the best guy, and right as you were about to express yourself as the best guy, you hurt yourself. Now you're not the best guy. You see what I mean? It's very amorphous. So again, if you're stuck into the process, that is how you transcend it all. So he gave me a couple of little tidbits. Well, he gave them to me all the time. First, about speed and explosion. And all of us are in a speed and explosion. He said, Ludi, when you shoot a gun, um, the speed, the power, uh, the bullet, the bullet, it kills you. I said, yes, yes, Sifu, it does. But not if your burrit is made of donut. <laughs> so your burrits are with donuts, they do not kill you. They have to be made of metal. Structural integrity. Think about our base nature for all of our sports work, athlete work. If the structure is not there, if the tensity or uh, the, the, uh, um, the integrity of the tissue, which takes time, the tendon strength, the bone strength, especially the combat guys that do a lot of striking, you can't supersede that. All right, don't shoot your gun with donut bullets, all right? <laughs> Full metal jacket, all right? The next one, he, the next thing he says, he, he says a lot of great things. So when I talk about infinite go, infinite go, he says, Ludi, why are you fake? Like, you know, maybe I, I observed a couple fighters, uh, you know, we, as we're all, all of us kids, especially us, us boys, we imitate our favorite fighters. And, and uh, you know, some cats may, Throw a fake or a posh or whatever. Ludi, if you have energy to fake, why not hit him? No fake. Teaches the brain wrong. So Ludi, your body is a Ferrari. My body is Volkswagen. I beat you every time. Ludi, you only know how to go to second gear, a parking brake one. <laughs> <laughs> Four-cylinder Volkswagen, I know how to go to Augie, I beat you every time. <laughs> so again, back to athletics, right? Take uh, your foot off the damn parking brake. Develop the engine. Learn to run through the gears. Ingrid, if she's here with her Olympic lifting or skills, you're seeing uh, poetry in motion. She rips through the gears. She knows how to work clutch. Um, another freaking gen from Chun Mensit. Um, his input in, in to me was profound. It still is. Um, the last little thing, oh, man, that's so special. So remember the people that you impact, and remember the people that impact you. Sit says, Ludi, very, very interesting. Uh, five years, no one knows my name, but now you win all the time, and they say, that's Ludi's teacher. So now Chin Man Sit is in all of the Kung Fu magazines. He is published now in very high-end martial arts journals. Um, he is, has a thriving business now. He no longer has to cook at a grocery store. And uh, anyway, really, really wonderful. Uh, and the same exotic esoterics that you're feeling that I'm expressing here are the, the things I feel that I'm learning from you all now. So it really is universal. All right, um, now recon, uh, next little video, it's only a second, you guys know this one, right? That's it, man, suffering, suffering, run fast, 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 have all your kit on with your weapon systems and your gas mask, and it becomes a suffering game, who can suffer more? And how do we suffer? We become professionals at compartmentalizing pain, which everybody in this room understands. Um, the problem is it's a young person's game. Um, I only lasted, and I was lucky, I lasted like this till 38. I'm 46 now, and then things started changing. Especially things were changing in my mind. The, the nervous system breakdowns, the emotional and uh, spiritual breakdowns, because this way of life is not sustainable. This is helping the chaos and destruction of the universe. It's not fighting it. And if you're not fighting the hate, the rage, the pain, even though in fighting it, you will feel those things, you don't get to develop. So that's recon. I learned, of course, the most austere discipline and in a, the gravest of circumstances. 
And now I look back as, as amazing tools, but I lived in it too long, and it corrupted my mind and my soul. Not fighting for my country, that didn't corrupt me. Not being an excellent competitive athlete, I became a swimmer, I swam from Alcatraz, I became quite an accomplished triathlete as well. Um, that didn't corrupt me. What corrupted me was the, was the product now, not the process. Part of my product was absolute aggression, suffering, and dominance. Because of all my experiences in war, being dominant um, was in the forefront of my identity. There is a time and a place for it, absolutely. And that's how you win in the match? Yes, but that's not your whole life. All right, so this is where we're at now, and this is what I want us to do, and I think we're already doing it. Uh, you, uh, athletes, warriors, something about sport, and I believe, because I'm watching all you guys and I'm listening all the time, uh, some of you throwers, sprinters, runners, lifters, you're always breaking through gravity and attempting to go light speed or beyond. So that's why I call it an astronaut. We're the athlete astronaut. And then we have to build our spaceship, all right? Because we've got cosmos and journeys in other universes and other life forms and other ways of life to explore, all right? Yeah, Gundam! Think of that's us. That's us in the, in the universe, all right? Constructing your spiritual spacesuit. Getting our minds right, as they say, as Tupac would say. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, I think touching back and this becoming a benchmark uh, in, our, in our monthly process, our, our uh, yearly process, where we're around like-minded uh, brothers and sisters and warriors, um, the altruism and the virtue of what has made us so great we are reminded, and, and with Bert's example, lovely talk, by the way, the mirror. We are all become mirrors for each other, except it's not, except even, it's, even when we fuck up with the mirrors in here, because, you know, we're, we all are a little rusty at some things, even that's beautiful. By that reflection, by getting community together, we can reflect on what is most advantageous and most absolutely uh, valuable spiritually to start con constructing this spacesuit, all right? Ah, the Meta Barons. So, uh, I'm crazy into Dune and science fiction and heroes and such, why? Because it empowered me to dream and think and believe. And with that conception, when you can believe, you can achieve. How those steps are gonna go, the dominoes is Andy's talk, which is a lovely way of looking at it. Um, the dominoes are us and the knowledge that we get from these experiences and these uh, relationships. Uh, and, then it, and then some of the dominoes are practice. When you can conceive and then you achieve that practice and the dominoes flow, infinite go, compound astrophysics stuff starts happening in our lives, right? And here's some of my spiritual spacesuit that I've been working on since I came back from the brink three years ago. All right, the litany against fear. This is my last video. But I do got some music at the end. All right, watch this one. Very powerful. This is from Dune. And I think these concepts you all can relate to. Now, you come here. She's using the voice. No. Some strength there. Surprising. Yeah. You see this? Put your right hand in the box. What's in the box? Pain. Stop. Put your hand in the box. I hold at your neck, a gomja bar. This one kills only animals. 
Are you suggesting that Duke's son is an animal? Let us say, I suggest you may be human. Your awareness may be powerful enough to control your instincts. Your instinct will be to remove your hand from the box. If you do so, you die. You will feel an itching there. Now the itching becomes burning. Heat upon heat upon heat. Timber. Silence! Silence! I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is a little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. I must not you feel flesh. The mind killer crisping. Death brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. flesh. Popping off. Here. Here is the little death. I must not fear. Here is the little death. I'm the pain! No! Enough! No woman, child, ever withstood that much. Take your hand out of the box and look at it. Young human. Do it. The 15 years you put into your sport and now you're at the, um, you know, you're at the pearly gates of glory and then you can't do what you want to do. Fear. And then you think, can I come back? Well, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. All y'all have been there. Uh, very, very profound. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. It is the little death that brings total obliteration. All the creativity, um, all of the skill, everything that we've cultivated in a lifetime of sport goes away in fear. I don't even know if I rate to freaking tell you guys anything because this is it's a journey that you've all been on. I just hope in me sharing it, maybe it will remind you of a few very, very good things. I will face my fear. I will face my fear and I will permit it to pass through me, over me. And where the fear has gone and from the path that I see, it will be nothing and only I will remain. And only I will remain. If that is not empowering and if that is not absolutely true, then nothing is true. That's why I wanted to close with the litany against fear. I recommend that you find or create your own if you need to, but damn straight, make that litany against fear and employ it every day, every time you're down, or every time maybe you think you're getting out of those left and right lateral limits, and uh, it'll do as good for you as it's done for me. Um, I'm going to end with this because, you know, uh, I'm a space traveler, and uh, I'm an emotional cosmonaut. Um, where's my little guy? Okay. Um, I, oh, I put it in my pocket. I, I said, yeah, all right, all right. Okay, now play this, bro. Play this! This is Moon Age Daydream. Of course, it's David Bowie. It's about space travel. All right, turn it up. I'm a motherfucker looking for you. I'm a space invader. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you. Right? Ah, you. Boom. Put your electric eyes on me, baby. What? So good. Put your ray gun to my head. Not afraid. Put it to my head. Not afraid. Let's go, space, space. Anyway. Thank you, guys. Right on. Thank you, Rudy. <laughs> <laughs>